Google's breakthrough. The cloud giant claims it's defeated the decades-long Turing machine challenge, demonstrating a quantum computer capable of solving what a classical supercomputer could not compute within a human lifetime. But not so fast, says IBM. A new type of supercomputer could challenge Google's claim of invincibility. So Scott Fulton is here to talk about this uh, with us here today. And Scott, first things first, you know, what is a search engine company like Google doing trying to build a quantum supercomputer anyways? Well, hi, Karen, how are you? I uh, wanted to talk today about this claim about supremacy in quantum computing and how Google, which we all know normally to be a search engine company, uh, has, has demonstrated effectively what may yet be proven by peers to be what one scientist at Caltech, who helped uh, coin the concept of, of modern quantum computing, considers quantum supremacy. That's a word that means a number of different things these days. As to your question about why Google, uh, Google wants to be in this industry because it wants to have a place in cloud computing. It doesn't like to be the number three cloud computing player at the table. And if you're wondering, what does a quantum computer have to do with a, with a cloud computing platform? Well, cloud computing has built a market, a market of people who need uh, cloud services, of, of enterprises that need cloud services, storage, processing. And uh, it's, the cloud gives them a way to provision those services automatically. If you could do the same kind of thing with a quantum computer, you could take previously unsolvable problems like predict for me what uh, what the surface levels of, of uh, ocean adjacent countries are going to be uh, in 15 years time given the current state of global warming and they take those unsolvable problems and you know within a few minutes time give you with a reasonable degree of accuracy uh, what these sea levels could look like uh, assuming you know how to generate a quantum algorithm which is not going to be easy for a lot of people, but certainly Google has been in the business of doing, of accomplishing certain things that weren't easy before. I mean, for heaven's sake, look at the search engine query itself. Imagine all the type of Boolean logic that somebody had to do in the past to uh, query a sophisticated textual database circa 1989. And look how easy it is for you and me to do it hundreds of times a day. They would like to be able to do something like that with quantum. And in order to be able to do that, they have to actually be in the hardware business. They have to produce a processor that's capable of, of performing these services that were heretofore uh, undoable. The gauntlet that was laid down by Caltech's John Preskill was uh, that supremacy would happen when a quantum computer could perform a task that it is unreasonable to expect a classical computer or a classical supercomputer to ever be able to do. And uh, as you've probably seen a couple places on ZDNet, uh, th there are multiple stories on this where Google has demonstrated uh, to, uh, a system that uses a 53 qubit string, a qubit being the equivalent of a bit in quantum computing, a 53 qubit string that can solve a previously uh, unsolvable problem in, in, in quantum mechanics in a period of time of about 200 seconds, which is pretty darn good. In order to, to claim that there was any supremacy involved in it, they had to demonstrate that a classical computer could not do this. And that's their demonstration that says if you took, if you, if you use the systems you have today and you took a quantum simulator in a classical supercomputer and pose this same problem to it. Because linear problems take exponentially longer to solve in a classical supercomputer, it could take longer period of time than the human beings would actually live. It could take a few hundred years to solve the same problem that it took a few hundred seconds to solve it here for Google. So congratulations, say a number of people, supremacy has happened. Well, and it, and it does sound like a genuine uh, breakthrough, Scott, but as I alluded to uh, first or there earlier in the introduction, uh, from what I'm seeing though, IBM is, is throwing cold water on Google's claim here. It, it, throwing cold water, spraying it, there's cold water coming from someplace in the general direction of IBM. 
Um, IBM has uh, a wonderful tendency to come in on the back end of, of major technological advancements. Uh, last decade, when Intel came up with a, a wonderful concept for reinventing the transistor, changing the concept of the transistor to make it more three-dimensional, IBM came in, came in on the back end literally on the same day that Intel made that announcement and say, well, yeah, we can do basically the same thing, but we could do it uh, on another method. A lot of times, uh, IBM has had to find itself playing catch-up. Well, this is a situation where it doesn't want to play catch-up anymore. It wants to be firmly in the supercomputer business. This is a kind of a defensive move on IBM's part. One of the things it's claiming is that uh, Google's claim that it would take a few hundred years for a classical supercomputer to do the same thing um, is, is, not, is not exactly correct if you reconfigure the way memory works in the supercomputer. And in a strange way, that's why I have Norman Rockwell joining us today. Behind me is uh, a classic Norman Rockwell painting of a girl watching herself in, uh, in a hair salon mirror. And, you, and I, you're, you're saying to yourself, what in God's name is Scott talking about now? Why does Norman Rockwell have anything to do with this topic? Well, it's, it's, an, it's a way of introducing a model that I think could explain both the Google situation and IBM's rebuttal to it. And it has to do with the way quantum computing works and kind of the magic involved in it. If you've ever been to a hair salon, and I know you're looking at me, you're thinking this guy goes less and less often. Uh, you've probably had a situation where you've had a child on your lap and the person's getting bored and you want to kind of entertain that person while you're getting your hair done. So you give this child uh, a math problem. Something that, that, that uh, a challenge. Way to solve math problems. See how quick you can do your math problem and show me your answer in the mirror of, of the hair salon. Now, let's say for the sake of argument that your child who's sitting on your lap is a binary digit, the classical binary digit that you'd find in an ordinary computer. That binary digit's only going to be capable of flipping that piece of paper around and showing that result for, for mommy or daddy and saying zero or one as the answer to a math problem. And you only have to teach that, that child four addition problems, O plus O, O plus one, one plus O, and one plus one. And that, that child will be very happily um, uh, turning over that answer. Now suppose that, in, that on the opposite side of the wall where, where the child's looking in the mirror, there's another mirror back on the other, other wall. And what child hasn't gone gaga seeing himself or herself reflected several times in, in a, a hair salon mirror. Well, in a way, that's kind of analogetic to the way that quantum computing works. When you have several qubits in a quantum computer, they're all entangled. They all reflect on one another. And in a strange way, they all see themselves multiply reflected in this magnificent mirror. So imagine if you lived in a universe where you could give a math problem that was more complex, and each of those reflections of that child on your lap could hold up a piece of paper that represented one of the digits in, in the result. And they would all take exactly the same amount of time or only just fractionally more, fractionally longer than they would with a zero or one thing. Uh, and you could give them much more complex problems. For each additional child you saw in the mirror, you would have one more order of, of complexity of problem that you could give the child. You could give her a five digit problem if you saw five children. You could give her a 15 digit problem if you saw 15 children. And the number of possible responses for a 15 child problem would be uh, each digit is two to the 15th power. So you could give supremacy, you could give really long problems. Well, Google did this with a 53 qubit problem with 53 children in the mirror solving a problem with the same wonder and joy as solving that one plus one. Um, and and that, that's kind of the joy of, of, of doing that, seeing these, inter, these, these quantum interdependent children in various universes for, the, for reasons that we still can't explain, 
solving these, these uh, uh, interdimensional complex problems. Now, Google says, uh, says simulating these mirrors and this effects in classical computers takes an exponentially longer period of time with each mirror that we have. And uh, IBM says, no, no, not necessarily. Not if you partition the way that, uh, that memory works in a supercomputer. If you use solid state memory in such a way where you zone off uh, which banks of secondary memory that each mirror in the hair salon would use. Uh, and, and if you break them down into smaller and smaller segments, then you could get the simulated quantum problem done, maybe not in 200 seconds, but hey, how about two and a half days? That ain't so bad. And that, that doesn't fulfill, it, it changes, it sets the goalpost on a different way, in a different line. Maybe it's not quantum supremacy, it could be quantum superiority, but it's, it's not something that the classical computer absolutely can't do for itself. So, okay, well, I'll, I, I was wondering how you're gonna be Rockwell and Scott, <laughs> now I get it. Uh, so all of that to be said, when or, or will this kind of research, do you think, lead to anything uh, you know, practical? That's what we always wanna to get to, that researchers in the everyday world say, we'll, you know, we'll be able to use. Well, uh, Google's Sundar Pichai uh, has been saying that it, with, with these types of advancements, you're going to see the capability for automotive designers to come up with uh, better ways to use solar energy, to use, uh, to use lithium ion batteries, to, to get your, your automobiles away from petroleum and things like that. Now, that's also a promise that you've seen applied uh, to, to classical computing situations. So you kind of wonder sometimes, well, just because you make things faster, are you really opening up avenues that, that, that you, you haven't done before? The, the, the hope of a, of a quantum computing system is that you can apply a mathematical uh, formula to several different uh, inputs in an array simultaneously and have all of those elements yield results so that you could do time series simulations of things like the effects of climate change on parts of the planet. Uh, now, making that practical means attaching these things to some type of a unit that lets you operate it through your phone or your PC, assuming we still have PCs. I'm sure Stephen J. Vaughn Nichols will say something about whether we had PCs in a couple of years. Uh, but it, it requires some type of practical input. And that's the problem with a quantum system because a quantum system can't be watched. It's a, it's a type of a problem having to do with uh, the nature of quantum mechanics itself. If you're watching something, you're borrowing the photons that are in there and you're applying photons that weren't there before. So you're messing things up. So you're like a, like a little child building something with Legos and you're watching her do it. And she says, daddy, I can't build it if you're watching me. So that it kind of messes things up, whereas you don't have that problem with the classical supercomputer system. And this is where IBM starts to look more and more sensible. Because if you think about it, uh, we're taking problems that have not even been addressed in, in supercomputing mathematics. And if, if you apply them in a quantum sense, you've got something that could be done in a 200 seconds. But uh, that, that's that making it like the Federal Express, if you will, uh, using the old name of FedEx, back when they, you remember when they used to say it absolutely positively has to be there overnight? Well, the shipping industry changed, not because, just because of overnight shipping, but because you could apply a business model that says, hey, you have it shipped in three or four days, maybe five or six days for a lesser price. That makes it practical all of a sudden, and it, 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 it makes it more affordable because you had overnight shipping. Well, imagine IBM coming along here and being the DHL of shipping, of, of, of quantum shipping, if you will, saying it, if we use Oak Ridge National Laboratory's Summit supercomputer and we, uh, we apply a system where we're using partition solid state memory and we can do it for you in three, four days, maybe not 200 seconds, but, but, but right away. And we'll give you a huge discount. Suddenly they've created a practical interest for this sort of thing. They, they've created an economy of scale. And because they've done so, 
uh, they help to set the price for the market. I mean, how much more will you pay to have an unsolvable problem solved in 200 seconds than three, four days when you didn't even know the problem could be solved before? Maybe not that much more. And that, that makes, makes me start thinking, perhaps IBM's uh, refutation of Google's claim is the actual breakthrough here, assuming, of course, that IBM can actually prove this. But they rushed out that paper, to tell you the truth. And they say, OK, we could probably do this in, in two and a half days. But we really haven't scientifically proven that we can do that yet. That's yet to be on the horizon. But I kind of I think this is going to happen. And we're going to learn some more about this, you know, probably even in the next few days, maybe even by the time you see this video, we'll have learned more about what Oak Ridge National Laboratory has in it up its sleeve for being able to demonstrate that you could have a cut rate discount unsolvable problem service that, that enterprises can use to say, okay, given our, our current business structure and our current situation and how our, our different monies are allocated, how do we look in 50 years time? Could you tell me in three days? Do I want to pay a premium for you to tell me in a few minutes? Or can I wait 72 hours? Uh, that's where the practical application of this is. And that's where I think IBM may have benefited from Google kicking it square in the teeth and uh, getting its act together. Yeah, a lot to consider here, uh, Scott. There's a, a lot of moving parts to this and interesting uh, to see certainly how it will all play out. And, and I know you will keep us posted on that and uh, certainly will here on ZDNet. And Scott's full article and much more to come can be found on ZDNet. Thanks for watching. Thank you.